Welcome to another Indie Dev Showcase here on the channel. Every week, I spotlight six of the many indie games that we play. And if you'd like to submit a game for a future video and stream, please get in touch. All the games shown today are either press key submissions or demos that we have checked out. And we are beginning with Asky the Cat. This was a game that was sent to me by the developer. And this feels very much like a uh, first time developer's take on a platformer. You play as, well, Asky the Cat here, who is on a grand adventure. And you're going to have to do a lot of jumping, finding random items, and hopefully not falling to pits and die. So, the game itself, it has a cute look to it, but the main heart of this game, of course, is in the 2D platform, and you can bounce on enemies, you can also shoot out or, you know, scream a, I guess that's a meow in another language, to hit enemies with it. And there are bonus games, items you can buy, and things like that. The game definitely goes for, I think, a little bit overstuffed in terms of the resources, items, and things that can show up in a level. And like I said, it does feel very much like a first-time developer's take on platforming design, especially when it comes to the platforming physics itself. The platforming is a little bit on the clunkier side from when we played it. You have to make a lot of very precise jumps, but how ASCII jumps and moves in the air feels a little bit off to me. And if you've played enough platformers, you'll get that same sense of feel when you play it. And Despite that, there are a lot of character-wide jumps you have to make in it. And unfortunately, while the game has a decent look to it and some interesting aspects in, in terms of that, it's unfortunately not a platformer that I can recommend. If you're looking for a platformer, there are definitely far more refined and better examples out there. And I would say, unfortunately, to hold off on this one unless you are really looking for a new one to play. For our next game, we turn to Hellbound. And this is one of those games that you can pretty much sum up everything about it simply by looking at the thumbnail that I posted in the bottom right hand corner of this section. But this is a, as the game describes it, a retro-minded 90s shooter released 30 years later. You have your metal, you have your tough as nails uh, hero here, and of course, you have hell, or a planet very similar to it. Bad guys have taken over, you have a gun, just start ripping and tearing. Now, I really love the aesthetic of this game, especially the background environments. It has that kind of like, I'm not sure I would describe it like that, chunky like clay kind of a stag, where, you know, everything has like that, not exactly realistic, but it looks like it could actually exist kind of feel to it. Now, our story, of course, again, is pretty much just optional. Each level has you going around, killing bad guys, finding keys, getting new weapons, rinse and repeat. Now, while the game says it came out 30 years after 90 shooters, it does feel even a little bit more dated than that. If you are someone who really enjoys kind of the latest wave of shooters, or boomer shooters, or whatever you want to call them kind of shooters, this one feels a little bit more restrictive and held back. And despite kind of the heavy metal theme and just the trying to get your blood pumping, it does feel feel, I think, a little bit too simplistic. Enemies will run out at you, they will snipe at you from across the map, and you don't really have too many options other than shoot or maybe stab them with your melee weapon. And unfortunately, like if this game came out maybe six, seven years, or maybe a few years prior, especially before the likes of Doom 2016, I would look at it a little bit more favorably. If you're somebody who really likes modern retro shooters and again, the boomer shooter kind of feel to it, I would say give this one a check. It is on the shorter side, 
But if you are somebody who really enjoy Doom Eternal, Ultra Kill, Dread Templar, and kind of some of the more contemporary takes on FPS gameplay, then this one may be a step too far back for you. We now switch from hardcore metal to something a little bit more lighter. This is Effie. I hopefully uh, didn't butcher that name too much. This is a 3D platformer slash open world or maybe uh, open-ish kind of gameplay. We play as Effie here, who has been cursed. And in order to free himself from the curse, he has to do something selfless, which in this case is going to be saving the land from an evil, I believe a sorceress or queen. And to do all that, well, he's going to do what we always do in 3D platformers, double jump, hang from ledges, and collect lots and lots of MacGuffins. And apparently do hoverboarding as well. So our general process of this game, again, is pretty much everything that we've seen from 3D platformers. Go into the world, complete various quests and solve areas, which will gain new abilities, which in turn will let you access more of the world itself. There are hidden collectibles as well as upgrades that will let you get more health and unlock a few new abilities along the way. Combat is on the basic side as you're going to be locking onto enemies and just uh, mashing your, I guess, hollow shield or whatever that thing is in order to deal with them. And Effie is one of those games that, again, I always describe as non-threatening. It's not a bad game by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not a game that I think is going to be m remembered after its release. All the general gameplay is on the basic side, and there are plenty of examples of games that have done more in terms of these various gameplay loops. So, all in all, if you're looking for another 3D platformer, and again, something that you've seen many times already, I would say give this one a check. But if you're like me and you're still waiting for that 3D platformer to go above and beyond, I don't think Effie quite gets there. But with that said, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we have three more games to look at for our spotlight. If you're interested in my books on design, then check these out. For entry-level students, we have 20 essential games to study, and then the Game Design Deep Dive series that takes an extensive look at different genres with free-to-play coming in 2022. For our next game, we have Ceridium Ultimate, and this is a title that basically begs to ask the question, what if we made Pokemon even more extreme in terms of its systems and design? So this is technically the fourth game in the Ceridium series, and what this is is a monster collecting RPG with oodles and oodles and oodles of different systems and mechanics that go into it. Every monster belongs to a different class or family. You can combine monsters into new monsters that share the various traits. You can also have different starting classes that affect what kind of things you can focus on, especially having class-specific abilities as well. And the game itself is each one basically follows the same story that some bad guy is trying to take over the multiverse or the multi universe, and you need to round up the various gods to help you. But unfortunately, all the gods want you to go fight things that may or may not be good or bad, and there are some evil and mysterious revelations that go into it. So, the general gameplay, as you can see, is more about kind of the planning and setting up of your characters as opposed to really having like an in-depth, you know, character by character, uh, turn by turn focus. You want to set things up so that the characters not only complement each other, but whatever spells and abilities you give them will also complement their innate abilities. Because every monster in Ceruleum Ultimate has a unique passive to it. One monster could gain power every time an ally dies, 
Another one could provide free healing. Someone could reverse healing so that if anyone tries to use a healing spell, they take damage. And there is a ton of depth to this game and franchise. I have not even gone to any of the post-game content that adds in even more systems and challenges to go with it. And this is one of those games and franchises that, very much like the Descaea games, that either you are going to play this for maybe like 30 minutes to an hour and bounce off of it, or you are going to be all in and play this game for months in terms of how much depth there is. With that said, Cerulean Ultimate is the latest iteration of it, but it still feels like it's lacking in terms of UI UX. The entire, I think, onboarding and UI could really do an overall to be a little bit more streamlined, especially with trying to set up macros and making sure that it's easy to follow what's going on. You see, the game itself is linear in its main quest. So depending upon what you choose as your starting class and what you focus on will greatly impact your overall difficulty and experience of the game. And it's another one of those titles where it's very hard to figure out why you're not winning. Not only because you have all the different rules that are going into things, but also so many different options in terms of how you can impact your characters. You can give them spell gems, with each spell gem belonging to a different class or family. You can give them gear, you can modify the gear. You can, again, uh, combine monsters and do all manner of things. And I think the game could have done a better job of at least onboarding the player in terms of when and where to use them. You see, the bosses in each area of Cerulean Ultimate definitely lean into the puzzle territory because they'll have their own unique rules and systems to them or their own unique powers, and you need to figure out how to build your party accordingly. If you focus, for instance, on a party that's all about powering up one character and the boss, let's say, can only be hit by, you know, the third hit of a monster during a turn, well, then you're not going to be able to do a damn thing to it. And so this is one of those games that I would suggest if you have any interest in kind of the monster collecting RPGs and you like very in-depth design around that, definitely check out Cerulean Ultimate. Again, each iteration follows the same basic story, and you basically just get more depth with each iteration, so it's perfectly fine to start with Ultimate. But if all of this sounds way above what you're looking for in a game, then this may be a little too advanced for you. Now up we have Space Gladiators Escaping Tartarus. This is an action roguelike, and it's essentially, what if we combine Hollow Knight with kind of the gross-out, I guess, elements of The Binding of Isaac. So our mission is that we are trapped by an alien force to fight in these gladiatorial arenas, and it's up to us to go around, uh, smack bad guys, get loot, and hopefully, well, escape. So, the Hollow Knight comparison is very much apt, as you have a dash that you can do both on the ground and the air, you can bounce off of enemies by attacking downward, and the game itself is built around, again, like these handmade rooms that are going to be randomly stitched together to create each run. Now, one thing that the game does a little bit differently is that there's a little bit more in terms of stack-based progression that you'll find various gear, well, and upgrades as we know from roguelikes and roguelites. And these gears will give you stats, which will affect how your character behaves as well as changing or enhancing weapons and items that go with it. Such as if you want to use more like range items and things along those lines, you want to raise your attack skill. While you want to just go around punch more, punch things harder, you want to get more in terms of strength-based attacks. Now, 
The game does feature persistence, that the more you play a character, you'll unlock permanent bonuses as well as unlocking new content, such as new enemies that can appear, new items, so on and so forth. And overall, this feels like a very well done action roguelike. The problem I think the game has is that it doesn't feel like there's a lot of variance in the runs compared to, again, some of like our high standards like Enter the Gungeon and The Buying of Isaac. Because your characters are very much built on specific abilities and just the general application of them, the new weapons and things that you find in each run aren't really changing like the basic moment-to-moment -moment gameplay or your basic strategies as in a Buying of Isaac style game. And the game does get quite difficult. It can sometimes become very hard to keep track of what's going on. Many enemies will have hurt boxes or will become a hitbox themselves, but it only happens when they're kind of that very faintly glowing red. And when you're busy dodging and hopping and smashing around an arena, it can be hard to keep track of what's safe and what's dangerous. And it is a game that, because of the high skill involved, it is also a lot more platforming dependent compared to some of the other action roguelikes. Like if you weren't, or if you were hoping that Dead Cells would do more in terms of its platforming challenges, then uh, Space Gladiator is definitely going to be for you in that regard. But if you're not a fan of platforming, especially the kind of platforming we saw in Hollow Knight, then it may be a little too frustrating for those of you looking for more of the roguelike kind of experience. Nevertheless, I think this is a pretty good game. If you are, again, looking for a new action roguelike to check out, then I would say definitely play Split, uh, Space Gladiators. But again, keep in mind that this is, I think, more on the advanced side compared to some of the other recent entries in the action roguelike genre in terms of kind of like weaning new players into it. For our final game of this week's episode, this is Neuro Deck the Game. And this is a psychological deck building roguelike. Your job is to explore a person's mind and use various cards here to fight different phobias and fears. And you'll have to use the power of, well, in this case, video games and pizza in order to deal with <laughs> our enemy here. I have to say, from an aesthetics point of view, I love the phobia designs. They all have like this very much like body horror, disturbing look and feel to them. And if you are somebody who is affected by any of these phobias, the game may do a number on you in that respect. In terms of the gameplay itself, each phobia is basically like the quote unquote battle and boss fight. You'll be able to choose which ones you face after each run, which will give you different rewards. Those rewards will go into your deck and become part of your strategy going forward. Also, the game has this kind of unlocking system where you have to answer a psychological profile to get a new class or a new build. And I was not a big fan of it because it just seemed like the game is trying to, I think, have a message or, you know, preach a little bit in terms of its design. And I don't think the mechanics really, you know, the game writes a check that the gameplay can't cash, I guess. Because the lesson or the psychological test, if you do it, like, in a certain way, you get a different reward. But if you do it in a way that you've already gotten the reward, then you get nothing. So the only real point is you want to exploit it just so you get go through the different answers, get all the rewards. The cards themselves are interesting, but the problem the game has is that it feels like it is very much built around very burst style decks. Because the various phobias have a set path or a set uh, pattern of how they'll attack you, they'll tend to escalate from uh, turn to turn. 
So if you're not able to keep up or just hit them hard enough, you're going to just lose by attrition alone. And it definitely lacks kind of the depth and the more or the greater variety of choices that we see from other deck builders like Slay the Spire, Monster Train, and so on. And unfortunately, while I like the aesthetics and the general themes of this game, it just doesn't, I think, hold everything together enough to make me want to play this one over some of the other better options out there. I would say if you're looking for inspiration for creepy monster designs, and definitely check this one out just for the phobias alone. But again, if you're looking for the next great deck builder, I don't think Neuro Deck is it, unfortunately. So with that said, we're going to wrap up this week's spotlight here. As always, I'd like to thank the developers who submitted games. If you'd like me to take a look at your game in the future, please get in touch. Check out our Discord and Patreon link down below. And if you'd like to get acknowledgement in my next book, we are running the promotion of $15 or more of any kind of donation. We'll get you an acknowledgement. Come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where some of the are in science of games. And until next time, take care.